Hello, I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, host of Higher Education Today, a production of the University of the District of Columbia. Welcome back to the education program that connects you to contemporary issues, people, and institutions involved in the world of higher education. Today we'll be talking about schools of design. Juana Medina is an illustrator and designer. She was one of the youngest faculty members at the Rhode Island School of Design, where she was a critic in the industrial design department. Originally from Bogota, Colombia, Juana currently teaches in the digital media department at the Corcoran College of Art and Design. John DeMeo Jr. is a faculty member and interim chair of graphic design at VCU Arts, Virginia Commonwealth University School of the Arts. John has a design background in information analysis and design methodology. John helped develop the design curriculum at VCU's School of the Arts in Qatar in the Middle East. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Well, thanks again for coming. And if I could start with you, Juana, uh, if you wouldn't mind saying a word or two about art and design. We always hear the words art and design. Could you separate that out for us and explain to viewers what is design? What is design? Um, design comes down to everything. Uh, glasses are design, microphones are design, um, lamps are design, but um, ultimately it's the marriage of form and function um, where emotions uh, play a huge role. So I would feel emotional about your glasses? Um, hopefully I would feel well about my glasses and they portray uh, a Juana sense uh, that makes me feel well about my glasses. So it's, it's um, more than them um, delivering emotional messages to you. Uh, how do we identify uh, with the objects that are around us? So I, I would say um, there is a sense of emotional functionality to design. And John, would you agree that, that there's an emotional aspect of design? I, I think so, and I, I would maybe take that a little bit farther and say that everybody really is a designer. I think uh, you know, when you get up in the morning, when you decide what you're going to wear or how you're going to do your hair, you're actually acting as a designer. You're trying to emotionally set yourself up for the day and, and, and the way that people will respond to you. So, okay, this is interesting. Uh, I wasn't expecting you guys to say that, but that's, that's fine. So in terms, of, in, in terms of the design when you wake up in the morning every day, how does that relate to your role in society? Okay. Uh, I'll take that. <laughs> I think depending on who you, who you are and what your position is, you tend to dress in a particular way. For example, congressmen all have suits on. And, um, if you're a, a, a worker who's a, maybe a blue collar worker, you're going to wear clothes that are, are capable of being messed up without it being a problem. So you're really designing your outfit to fit the things that you're going to be doing during the day. Fair enough. But what about a school of design? I mean, you both teach at schools of design. So what, what are some of the main subjects that students are studying at schools of design? Well, they, uh, when you're studying design, you have to study form. Um, and function and uh, going back to your question regarding arts and uh, how arts and design might play together, um, arts tend to be a, a great starting point for us to understand aesthetics and their values. Um, and then once we sum that up with the functional needs of objects, um, we come into the terrain of design. Could you translate that a little bit in terms of somebody who doesn't necessarily follow all the intricacies of design? What does that mean to kind of follow, to kind of go down that path? What exactly are you teaching a student who, who has never studied design, comes into your classroom? What is some of the, if you could break that down a little bit, what is, what is a student studying? Sure. Well, we start at a very basic level and it's um, perhaps drawing and how do we perceive form, how do we observe things, uh, can we be curious about how things work, how we relate to certain objects. So for example, we could start breaking it by just holding a pencil and observing a cube, something as simple as just, you know, something that has just very flat shapes and, and, and edges to it and, and then starting noticing volume and form and weight and how it relates to space and from that uh, perhaps adding more cubes to it and uh, little by little transforming it into a hammer or a um, brush or um, a chair and then seeing how that same structure will somehow relate to that space. So 
if it's a chair, for example, is it going to be in a cafeteria? Is it going to be a chair for a bus? Is it going to be a chair at a nursing home? Um, and who's going to be using it and so on. So those are the implications of design from conception as something as basic as holding a pencil and drawing a cube. That's interesting. So, you, so we're, we're focused on the form and we're also focused on the function. So if you're designing a chair for a, a nursing home, obviously the most important thing is safety, I'm assuming. Could be one of the most important things uh, along with how is the person who's going to be sitting on the chair feeling. Uh, so it's not about just making it safe but also um, again, talking about emotional aspects of design, is the person who's going to be sitting in the chair comfortable to spend the day there or, 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 or feel just at ease within that space? Hmm. John, do you agree that, 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 that a person who, when they sit on a chair, feels a certain way? Um, designers are known to put up a lot of things for the sake of design, a lot of uncomfortable things, for example, chairs that look really good but aren't very comfortable. <laughs> so we're probably not the best ones to ask about that. But um, I think it does affect, uh, again, the way uh, people feel about the space that they're in. Um, I think where I would maybe like to take that if we're talking about design is that it's not just the, really the, the function of, of the chair or the emotional aspect that a person has with it, but you think about it in terms of the whole life cycle of that chair. Mm -hmm in uh, where are the materials sourced from to make that chair? Is it a sustain sustainable kind of sourcing material? What happens at the end of the life of that chair? And uh, it, so it becomes a, a really kind of a complex problem uh, uh, when you're thinking about the design of an object. It's just not the object itself, but how it fits in the whole context of, of, of the world. Really. This is interesting. So let's assume I was a student at VCU and I said to you that I wanted to have a career in designing chairs. How would we proceed? Well, you would, you would want to be in an industrial design or a product design discipline because they're going to focus on products more so than, than some other disciplines. But you would start, at least at VCU, we start with a, a common foundation program for actually art and design students where they're learning basics of, of design and drawing and uh, color and and, and how you would put things together in terms of time and space, movement. And then uh, you go into a more specific curriculum that's geared toward the particular area that you're interested in. And it builds on um, uh, a series of steps um, from simple to complex kinds of problems. And would the same be true of somebody thinking about that at the Corcoran or at RISD or at MICA? I, I would think so. We, we all started there at a just mm -hmm. foundations level where everybody gets acquainted and introduced to many, many hours of drawing and, and, and critical observation um, and uh, just evaluating how things relate to space, uh, how form is conceived, and then from there on you start accumulating a little further knowledge depending on whether you want to design chairs or vehicles or um, clothing. Um, or posters, so it will depend on where you want to go into, but, but I would say the foundation level is, um, as, as far as I know, um, quite um, um, structured in a, in a very similar way uh, within art schools. Fair enough, and let's talk about imagination, if we, because I think you guys are raising an interesting question about the relationship of design to our broader world, but let's assume that I think of things in a different way than the average person. Should I sit down at my computer and design it? Should I sit down with a pencil and start designing? Should I go to a beach? Should I go to a hotel lobby and observe uh, the aesthetics of the hotel lobby? How do I, how do I start designing things? Mm -hmm. Wherever imagination finds you. I, I wouldn't say that there's a particular spot or a central space that leads you to just flourishing that imagination, but wherever you're able to get that inspiration, just start drawing and start just somehow experimenting and, and, and putting it into tangible form in some sort of way, whether through drawing or through photographs or through even if it is knitting or whatever form it is, to start conceiving how it will relate to, to space. Um, and once that is done, obviously take further exploration of that and, and try to be critical. Introducing other people to what you're doing is very important. 
um, and, and not just believing that design is this very personal, individualistic thing, but rather something that takes a collaborative effort for it to happen. To follow up on that, I think one of the things that it's important to recognize is that really you're not designing something for yourself, you're designing it for a user out there. So it's really important to get the input of that end user about how it should be designed or what they think it should do. But let's say you don't know that end user. Like you're wearing a very nice tie. Mm -hmm. That tie seems appealing to me. Um, but how would you know that I would find that appealing if you were putting that on this morning or if you were somehow designing ties for whatever company made that tie? You want to take it? Well, since it's your okay. tie. I will. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think kind of the traditional method has been to, to come up with a product or a design and, and present it to a focus group and see what their response is. And if it's a good response, then you might take it forward. I think um, that's changing a little bit uh, because the, the things that designers are, are interested in has, is changing. Um, I think we're beginning to be less interested in specific products and more interested in complex systems and how you can play a strategic role in designing things that uh, are going to have more of an influence and an effect on society and the culture as a whole. So in that case, um, really the design process is changing from this kind of product-oriented uh, way of thinking about design to a more process-oriented where you begin to include a greater range of stakeholders rather than just, just yourself. Um, you not only include uh, the client, maybe, but you include the end, the end user. Well, let's go beyond the tie, as, as I think you, that you fairly point out. But let's assume we're designing a map for a new subway system, or we're designing an aspect of the space station. You know, as you can see, mm -hmm. these safety issues are, are paramount here. How would a designer interact with a map maker or the people who are designing the space shuttle? or the old space shuttle, or the new, or the space station, which hopefully we'll continue to use as a society? I, that's a good question, and I think that more and more of that is happening, because that's the direction that we're going in. We're talking about like transdisciplinarity, and so uh, what we're trying to do is train young designers to be able to work with other disciplines uh, who might have a particular expertise that's important for a particular project, to be able to converse with them, understand what they're saying, and be able to collaborate as a team come up with a, with, a, with a better end product. But, but let's, let's flesh, flesh it out just a little bit. I mean, as you may know, in Washington, uh, there is going to be an expansion of our metro system. Mm -hmm. And the question is going to come down to how do we represent that in two dimensions in a map? That there are a lot of tourists in Washington who don't live here and can easily get lost with a lot of little kids, right? And it's, you know, obviously there are safety issues here. How do we balance the precision of the map versus the simplicity of the map? I think it starts on just making a long list of all the elements that play a role for this problem to be solved. Um, and uh, what is this map going to do? How is it going to interact? Or how are people going to interact with this map? Um, where is it going to be located? Why is it going to be there? Uh, and once you start answering those questions, it's, it's a little bit easier to just funnel down. And I think funneling down or, or an inverted pyramid in a way is, is something that we often take in design to just guarantee that we're getting all the elements um, covered in order to just respond with the best solution possible. So. In, in the case of, of a map or, or, or a particular product and even a tie, um, setting up demographics definitely guarantees that you are able to respond uh, with, with the best solution possible. Um, at the same time, there's a voice of a designer that comes through um, and there are unexpected results that you might n never have thought of, but at the same time can can benefit greatly from it. And, and if you see in design history, we have benefited from it greatly by looking at how corks have been invented or post-its or uh, champagne um, and so on that were seemingly accidents, but at the same time ended up responding with an unexpected solution to design. Yeah, I and I would say at the same time that you're going through this process, it's probably important to, to gather uh, a group of, of people who would actually be map users in some way and say, what are the things that you want to find on a map? How, how, how do you use a map? 
Um, what are the elements of a map that you understand and what things don't you understand? So that, that can be factored in right from the beginning. Fair enough, interesting. What about issues of movement? Where does movement fall into this? One if maybe I know you studied movement when you were younger, younger in uh, Colombia. Mm -hmm. um, movement plays a huge role, and uh, design right now is is leaning a little bit towards uh, multimedia and uh, uh, interactivity, and and how do we integrate that very important aspect of of movement um, and. Uh, it, it can come in so many different forms. It can be by having kinetic typography, just having letter forms moving on a screen, up to how do we guarantee that people, regardless of having disabilities or being completely able to go up a ramp, can find out where they are just by having good signage on an airport, for example. Um, so movement is everywhere. It's, it's part of a human um, nature. Uh, so it, it is an integral part of design. That's interesting because if you think about a, an issue of an airport, there are a lot of people who come from lots of different backgrounds at airports, so you don't, and they may not necessarily speak English as, as, as their first tongue. I'm assuming English is your second language. That's correct. So, um, so when, you come to, when you came to the United States, did you find that the signs were welcoming? Um, it varies. I, I've, I've been lucky enough to come in through different airports and, and there are great variations depending on the traffic and how big the airports are. For example, if you arrive um, in New York through the Kennedy Airport, it's very different from arriving through Atlanta um, or uh, just a, in, in, in Miami. So it, it varies a lot, but um, I think there's a tendency to respond in different languages. At the same time, there are icons and symbols that help you get across. Um, so you will see arrows and you will see little ladies with a skirt to know where the bathroom is um, and, and on and on, just to guarantee that certain messages get across in the, in the most simple way possible. And that's design. Fair enough. And then John, in, in terms of your work, uh, you've done a lot of work overseas, particularly in Qatar. How did your design work with kind of an American sensibility work in the Middle East? Because of, as, as we all know, things are a little different in terms of the aesthetics in the Middle East and in terms of the sensitivities in the Middle East. That, that's actually a very interesting question. When we were asked to, to go over there, we were asked to implement the curriculum that we use uh, in Richmond. And uh, we thought about that a great deal. And we, we knew that we could, it was not our our purpose to go over there and put a patina of Western aesthetic mm -hmm. on what they do. Uh, the Qatari are very uh, concerned with their own culture and their own tradition, and we, we, we sensed that, and we, we wanted them to develop uh, their own kind of aesthetic in terms of what design should be. So we were, we were really sensitive to that issue. But let's assume that a person doesn't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. How do you help a person design an aesthetic if they've never really thought through that? I think it's, um, again, if we go back to the art foundation uh, and you start with the very basics of, of, of how, you, how you design an object, how you, how you uh, put things together to make a form, um, those things begin to express themselves um, and it's a matter of uh, encouraging them or uh, enlightening them as to what they're doing sometimes so that they recognize it even. Um, so that you begin to reinforce that. But let's assume that I, I wanted to design a church or a mosque. Would I, is it ethical for me to say I want people to feel a certain way when they go into that church or mosque? Oh, I think, I think the people that design churches and mosques do that. I think that there's a certain uh, emotive content to those spaces and, and, well, architects generally do them now. Um, stonemasons used to do Gothic cathedrals, but I think the feeling was that, uh, that there was some kind of um, impression that you wanted to have these people to gain from that space. And so there's, there's ways that those spaces are formed and created that hopefully reinforce that. But presumably that would be different from place to place. Like, uh, let's go to South America versus North America. I suspect that people have a different way of looking at either architecture or design or art generally in North America versus South America. How do you bridge that gap if you're helping somebody to design something that they want? 
Again, I think observation is key on just seeing what people need from a space, what people want from a space. Do, do they want to feel that they are the only person contained within that space, even though they're sharing it with 300 other people? Uh, do they want to feel part of a, a, a big unity? Um, and, and that's gathered through observation and, and tons and tons of questioning. And, and what is the space going to be used for? What is the purpose? Are there different purposes? Um, is, is this going to be a space used by the community at large and, and, and used as, you know, as a restaurant and then as, as a chapel? Um, or is it just destined to one particular use? So all those things, I think, are answered through great observation and, and, and continuing the conversation between the client, um, whoever the client is, and, and the designer. Fair enough. Uh, and I don't think the designer really comes to those projects necessarily as a blank slate. I think you know, they've, they've had history of design, history of art. Uh, they've been observing, they've been around, they've been in churches, they've been in mosques, and they have a sense of what those spaces are, why they feel the way they do. And, and so they, they, they're not coming at that completely, like I say, as a blank slate. But is there a university, a universi universi ver universal <laughs> universal aspect of beauty. If you were to look at Brancusi or Rodin, uh, certainly to a Western uh, eye, they're beautiful. Is that true around the world? We consider the aesthetical appeal of things very important. Uh, whether we want to recognize it or not, I believe that we are drawn to beauty. Um, and a great example of, of beauty and functionality uh, is designer Eva Seisel, who has done, especially through ceramics, um, beautiful industrial solutions uh, to the way that we perceive um, our uh, dinnerware and, and, and how we relate to a jug or a mug or a plate, something that is so innate to our culture in order to eat, which is something that every culture does. Um, and yet she makes a, a, a jar special just through its beauty. So beauty has a, a, a very strong component and it can be achieved through many, many different ways, but it, it has been a quest for centuries. And if you look at it, uh, it, it appears in architecture everywhere and uh, in design all around the world. So regardless of uh, different appeals to beauty, it, it's something that's very present on cultures throughout. But isn't there a point that it might be too, too, too much? So I mean, let's say I go to a new place and I see that it's a mug and I'm going to drink uh, some water out of the mug, uh, but I still have to recognize it's a mug. Mm -hmm. Um, well, that's, that's where the form and function balance does play a huge role. Um, so it's not all about beauty. Is it going to be functional for you to drink without spilling all over? Or uh, is, it, is it going to be a pleasant experience where you can figure out how to hold it and how it relates to you? Um, and, and sometimes objects are designed uh, with a specific purpose in mind, as I said, and then they end up being used for something completely different. Um, but again, a appeal just as an emotional sense and, and for you to be drawn to, to that particular object is it's <clears throat> an important part of design. But I, I think it kind of goes back to your, your first question about art and design and that um, really art is its own purpose, its own end. Whereas the design generally has a function. We may, may use it for something other than what it was intended, but it, it has a purpose that was originally intended to fulfill. Fair enough. And I think we're only out of time for one more question. Um, but if I could ask you both to just give some advice to some students who perhaps are not in your classes now who are thinking about studying design, what advice would you give for them? Give to them. That's a hard question. It is a very <laughs> hard question. <laughs> It's very interesting right now in that students that are coming into the foundation year, 
already have an understanding of design, much, I think much greater than I did years ago when I w went into it at first. And they seem to already be looking and understanding the world around them in a really different way and that they can take part in molding what that world is. And as long as they keep looking, I think they're okay. Yeah, I, I think within what John was mentioning, uh, remaining curious, I think, is the most important thing as a designer, just to come up with playful solutions that, that might lead to just better understanding. So, Terrific. Okay. Thank you both. Thank you. If you would like additional information about the Corcoran College of Art and Design or Virginia Commonwealth University School of the Arts, please visit corcoran.edu or arts.vcu.edu. If you have comments or suggestions about higher education today, please send an email to our viewer mailbox at highereducationtoday at topcolleges.com. Thank you for watching. We will continue to bring you quality discussions about important matters in today's college and university world. Please join me again for another edition of Higher Education Today. I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, and you've been watching Higher Education Today. <laughs>